Sean Clayton. Um, is the G wagon worth it? <laughs> is it? Uh, I'm a uh, car guy, and that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. G wagons are they're great cars. They hold their value. Are they really well? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Great. The reason I'm asking is because mm-hmm. I'm I'm always on the market. Yeah, I go through a car. Like, yeah, once every eighteen months. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, a vehicle, since we have to be in them so much, it's like, how do you take care of yourself in that? Um, and there's a reason that they're so damn expensive and they hold their value the way that they do. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, also a car is just a car. You know? right. So it's, right. you know, when you get to a point in life where you're like, oh, okay, I can create this for myself. Yeah. You know, you go in and you say, okay, like, you know, you just, you just choose something mm. and don't get attached to it. So I'm constantly detached from it. So that would happen, I wouldn't care. Right. Right. And I'm the guy that leaves my car doors unlocked. <laughs> like I'm just, you know, it's actually helped because they don't break into the car. Like when they break in, they open it, you just leave nothing in there. Mm. And they look around like, oh, there's nothing in here. And then they leave. So, so that's the pro tip. That's a pro tip. Leave yeah. it unlocked. We just don't leave any stuff in here. Yeah. Leave, leave it unlocked. Nothing, to, leave take. nothing yeah. to break. Nothing to take, nothing to break. We just coined a new term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we'll consider that a fun little icebreaker yeah. I actually got another one here for you mm-hmm. I'm a little disappointed that you didn't wear the hat oh yeah well I mean I could have worn the hat I was like, <laughs> I did, I did, you know it was like we're going on camera I'll doubt the hair up you never know what the lighting is and you know then you have like a shadow under yeah. your uh, under your eyes so great point great yeah. point no I'm, I'm selfish <laughs> saying that because I really like that hat man thanks man. super thanks. cool yeah it's a custom baseball hat it's a custom baseball hat yeah yeah Freaking awesome and then your symbol uh Remind me again. What does that mean? Which symbol are we, are we talking about? The one that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that was. Um. It's it's uh it's an intersection of the flower of life. So like if you take, do you know what the flower of life is? No. Okay. Do you know what sacred geometry is? No. Okay. <laughs> so, back in um, thousands of years ago, in the temple of Osiris in Egypt, they burnt this symbol into this temple. It's like laser etched into the symbol. It's this actual thing on my arm. How many years? Uh, I don't long know, it's, time. A, it's a long time ago. Long time, yeah, okay. it's like, thou, I think it's like 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, something like that, but it's burned into the Temple of Osiris. Um, mm. I'm not a historian, so I don't like lock-in dates, but I've read em- enough about it. And in this flower of life, there are 64 spheres that center around it. And the 64 spheres are mapped to, like basically the 64, you know, um, strands of DNA. Mm-hmm. Right yeah. there's 64. If you look at the I Ching, which is a ancient Eastern way of looking at religion, there's 64 different principles that you walk through. Inside of the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, there's this thing called the Tree of Life, which there's 32 spheros, like 32 different paths, and 10 spheros and 22 Hebrew letters. You there's masculine and feminine. Yeah, you put that together, it's 64. Mm. So there's there's code inside of this that helps you understand like how to move through life. And if you take the center part of that out, which is what I put on the hat, that helps you just understand how to go to the middle of source. If, you know, to take it a little weird on you. <laughs> no, nothing weird about it. Yeah. Hey, well, if we're going to get weird, might as well do it here. You yeah, might as well. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sean, what in the world? That's great. Yeah. Thanks for educating us. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness gracious. So I always like to kind of dive into to everybody's mission mm-hmm. that comes up because this is the elite league Mm-hmm. podcast yeah. recently rebranded um and you're certainly fitting the mold of an, an expert in your space mm-hmm. so let's talk about your mission with what you're doing so what mission there's there's quite a few missions <laughs> you help a lot of people <laughs> i help a lot of people yeah yeah, yeah. so i have well, we'll maybe talk about what i do and then go into the mission around it right let's so that's right um what i do i have I have a group called Mindful Ventures. Mm. Okay. And in Mindful Ventures, there are four companies that sit underneath it. There's a marketing agency called Myasin. Okay. There's my spiritual coaching practice, which is spiritual and abundance coaching. So if you're not spiritual, you want to be abundant. It's all the same thing. But, you know, I just help people like understand how to tap into that. That's called Science of Abundance, which is merging science, spirituality into a framework that allows individuals to become their best selves. It's comforting that there's science behind that. Oh, tons of science behind it. It's not just all woo-woo, like, you know, it's actually broken down into quantum physics and understanding how to math your way into it and the whole thing. Did y'all catch that? <laughs> it's freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. 
And then two. Yeah. No, number two. Uh, number, that's number two. Number three, we have an AI and um, blockchain agency yeah. um, that goes out and helps facilitate different applications around artificial intelligence and blockchain. You know, we do different projects with Solana and Ripple and a few other companies. And then the last one, we have a company called Myosin Regen, which is regenerative health, um, doing gene therapy and exosomes uh, down in Mexico where people can go down and basically get regenerated. Myosin. Myosin. What is that? So Myosin, when I first started the agency, so it started as the agency itself, is the, it's like the, the neural sheath or the space in between the nerves when they then connect with the muscles to get them to move. Mm. Okay. So our thing is, is what myosin is, is we help marketing move. We help regeneration move. We help AI and blockchain move. So it's like myosin XYZ, myosin marketing, and then myosin region. Mm-hmm. So we help things move, right? Yeah. And get them like out to the world in a, in a very um, energy, because it's just an energetic space that's in between it. So that was the thing that myosin is. Uh, how many people are in your organizational chart? Um... Uh, like 35, maybe. 35? 30 when did you start it? About five, four and a half, five years ago. Four and a half, five years ago. Somewhere in there. I and look at the date, but. What about the work ethic that, that it took to get there? Did you, are you the quintessential, like uh, like Elon Musk, for example, would sleep in his office just to save time, not go home. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's kind of the most extreme, and, and his success kind of sh- is a reflection of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but are, are you, were you just immersed in that regard? Mm, I'm, I'm a different, I'm a different animal than, than like somebody to, like that. I'd love to hear about the animal. <laughs> yeah, and so, and then I'll go back to the mission in a second because I need to ask that. So, um, Eli, you know, somebody, I'm not a diehard workaholic. I work to the capacity that I need to work, and a long time ago, it was being very sloppy and very, um, how would I put it, um, fear-based in my approach. So you're working because you're afraid to lose something. You're working because, oh, this client, I might not have that client tomorrow, so I'm going to be afraid to lose them, so I work under this lens of fear. Yeah. Okay? That wasn't an abundant way of living, and it creates a lot of sloppiness because you make mistakes because you're moving too fast because you're not actually doing what I would call still work or integrated work or work that's in flow. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like you look at Michael Jordan, for instance, or LeBron James, when they're in flow, like the game looks way different mm-hmm. Then we're trying to force an outcome. Right. They're trying to like take hard shots or they're like really going at the rim or they're doing like crazy things that don't look elegant. And that's because they're afraid they're going to lose when they know they're going to win. It shifts the whole dynamic. And so over the last two years, it's moved from a afraid to lose mind state to a knowing I'm going to win mind state. Was that just uh, based off the notion of choice? That's just choosing, yeah. That's choosing. Yeah. It's an awareness of where I was okay. and being so indentured to a traumatic upbringing, to seeing how my father lived, to being African-American and feeling like you're not good enough, to um, you know any any of those constructs from a business perspective or what the world says that you are. You know, even my story, you know, I don't know if we got into all this, but being formally incarcerated, you know, so I spent three years in federal prison to being, you know, sexually abused as a child to trying to take my life in my 20s to having broken relationships over and over again. My, what society says I should be, I should probably never get married to anybody wholesome again. Mm. I should never have a real paying job that does anything right outside of being a truck driver or space, something janitorial or maybe just some kind of like weird criminal. I should never, um, you know, what else, you know, shit, I should have all kind of like emotional issues because I had these things happen when I was in my youth. So all of that, if I were to follow societal constructs means that I should be really fucked up right now. Right. Right. And so that happens. What happens is, is because you're afraid to lose, you start to do these things cyclically. And once you become aware that those were gifts that I gave myself in order to understand how to be resilient in life, you make a choice to no longer choose that anymore. And then you start choosing abundance. You choose winning. You choose knowing. Mm-hmm. You don't hesitate. You just do things in a very precise manner. And then the vibration or the energy that you put off into the world attracts a different type of individual in your life. And then people want to work with you. Attract. Yeah. Buzzword. Yeah. 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 You go from an I state to a we state. You stop looking at myself as the person that is doing this stuff because I couldn't do, I couldn't be me. I couldn't be here without you. Right. 
Yeah. Right. I couldn't be in this building without the architects that made it. Right. So you have to look at everything and honor all of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the construction workers or the person that laid the carpet, you know, or the person who put the chip inside of that camera in order to make it functional. All of that is like this divine, beautiful thing that you're supposed to be grateful for. Most of us take it all for granted because we don't see that the grout and the actual tile on the wall behind you right now, right, was literally laid by somebody that who knows their story, but that's a representation of a legacy that they've left. And we just bypass most of it. What do you think that is? Because we're ungrateful. Who's we? Most of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. How often? I think most of humanity. Can you quantify it? I mean, on a percentage I, basis. I would say ninety nine point nine percent of the world is stuck in, in not appreciating the little things. You know, I'm gonna put pat myself on the back then. Yeah. Because I pulled up in a parking lot today. Yeah. To host a Zoom call. Yeah. And I literally thought to myself, "Wow, it is so nice mm -hmm. to be able to park on this super flat driveway." There you go. I'm like, this is freaking awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I'd say most people miss it. You know, it's like we right behind you is like a f picture of flowers. You know, people don't stop and smell the roses. There's a reason people say that because it's mm -hmm. the little, if you can't pay attention to the little things, you can't receive the big things. So what I recognize is I was moving so fast through life. And what I, what I, and what I realize also is that there's this billionaire mind state that is just go and do, go and do, but how you don't need that much fucking money. Like, you know, unless you're going to do a bunch of good in the world to where you have the capacity to just really help individuals at some point, it's like, how much, how many cars can you drive? How many houses can you live in? How much money can you really have? How many watches can you have? I went on this like thing where I was just like buying up. I mean, I have so many fucking clothes right now. I just give them away because I don't need all this stuff. Right. Right. And you, you move into like this space where, you know, enough is truly enough. And you're at that moment in time where you don't, you know, it's not about consuming. It's about being in balance of what you give and what you receive. And that becomes this constant flow because now you're this energy turbine of like love and abundance and helping. But then what people want to do is just here, take this because I know you're going to be responsible with it. Mm -hmm. And then if you put that in the context of business, people are like, oh, I really want to work with you. I don't know why, but I want to work with you. So here, I'm going to give you my budget in marketing, mm -hmm. or I'm going to give you, um, these projects on your AI or blockchain thing, or I'm going to give you, um, you know, my time, you know, inside of like my courses that I teach and I want to work with you. So here's money for that or whatever it might be. And then you become a facilitator, not only to provide them value, but then to take what they give you and do something meaningful with it. You know, sometimes I, I visualize, myself in the morning before I start my day, mm -hmm. I, I can like almost see an image of, of me mm -hmm. being suspended in the air, almost like kind of looking at, at the earth, just a little bit above it. Mm -hmm. And then ha being able to, that way I can have the 360 degree view. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think that that's just a representation of, of the ultimate uh, amount of presence. Cause I think that's my goal every day is to be present because when you're present, you can have the flow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they call that, um, have you heard the overview effect? Come on. There's a thing called the overview effect. I have a feeling you're going to ask me a lot of these, hey, have you ever heard of it? And I'm going to say no, which is why I'm so pumped to have you on here. Yeah, so there's, um, whenever astronauts go into space, they they have this like really blissful experience, so they yeah. say. Yeah. If you're not a flat earther, right? But they have this blissful experience. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Yeah. And where they look at the earth and they're like, oh my God, it, it changes their entire perspective of life because they are like, I'm so small in this thing where I used to think I was so big in my life. And then it changes like, it's like it's this crazy sp spiritual experience for them. I believe that. Oh yeah. And so when you zoom out and that's what's called, they have, um, this is guy's name is David Hawkins. And he has a scale of consciousness and inside of that scale of consciousness, it talks about everything all the way from shame, all the way up to enlightenment. And you have these different numbers that he associates with. It's an interesting book called power versus force. Mm. And, um, in that book, there's a, there's a place right after courage. Uh, there's courage, willingness, when then you go to a space called acceptance. And when you can accept everything in your life, it's like the zoom out, you zoom out and you look at it and you accept everything as this beautiful thing then you understand the reason why you created it, then it turns into love, then you have joy and peace, then you become enlightened. Boom. 
right? Yeah. So that what you're going through is this like awesome space of acceptance because you're looking at it and you're like, wow, this is really beautiful. This is everything. And I'm looking at it from the perspective of potentially what you would call source or God or the divine. And the energy that you place on it isn't something of judgment. It's some, not something of righteousness. It's just something of acceptance. Acceptance. Yeah. Really. Mm. You know, if I were to put myself in somebody's shoes mm -hmm. in a spaceship looking down on Earth, I can't say that it, I, I I would just accept anything. Well, why not? Well, I think what what comes to me is is gratitude. Like, wow, what that I get to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And and then I also ask the question, how can I brighten that? There you go. That's what. But that's acceptance, also acceptance. Is it? Because in order to have gratitude, you have to accept it. Mm. Right? Oh. Yeah. What a, <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> right. In order right. to put a light on it, you have to accept it if you were rejecting it. So most of what we do in like down-regulated states, like before you become courageous about anything in life, mm -hmm. is that you have shame, guilt, anxiety, you're rejecting, you're rejecting, you're pushing back. Right? Mm. And so all of those feelings and all those emotions that you have like our rejecting moments and then you get into the space. Well, okay, I'm, I'm actually courageous enough to not reject this and start to move into, I'm willing to be different. I'm willing to accept something and understand the reason. And then once you can accept and understand the reason, then you have gratitude. Gratitude is this whole loving thing because you're giving up this energy of like, Oh, I see you. I accept everything. I'm zoomed out on the, on the, not the alien, the astronaut, <laughs> maybe an alien. Maybe. But I'm the astronaut and I look at the world and I'm accepting the whole thing. I see the whole thing because you see it not as the people, you see it as the planet, you see it as the collective we, as everybody. Going back to your previous point. Yeah. And that's the way that we, we should see it. Yeah. We. We. Yeah. Yeah. You go from I to we. Have you always thought like that? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. You said that was such dominance. Not yeah, at all. Not you at all. You were like, you're no. sure shot. No. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. I mean, so, you know, now I have this philosophical thing that just went through my head. It's like, what is always, right? Yeah, what is that? Yeah, because <laughs> then what is time? Because mm -hmm. in this present moment, if I take this present moment and I expand it out, then yes, it's always, right? Mm -hmm. From this moment of this version of me. But the other versions of me, which aren't the same me as today because they're different versions, it's not the same me, right? Yeah. Your, your body recycles itself every seven years, right? you have like an entire new generation of who you are every seven years you go through these cycles. So this version, yes, always has seen it that way. These other versions of me, right? If somebody else were to look at my entire timeline and say, what does Sean exist of from zero to this period, right? For 45 years, what does that experience look like? Right. And so over the last two years of these space time coordinates of Sean Clayton's life, yes, this is how I've seen the world. The 43 years before that, not at all. Two years. Two years, yeah. What clicked? Um, or what did you choose? What did I choose? Well, accept? what what clicked, so about six years ago, I um, moved away from my home in Dallas. Mm. I went and really started going deeper into my what I thought was my work career. Moved to New York. Got heavy into digital, like heavier into digital advertising. Things move 10 times faster in New York than they do in Dallas, Texas, which is where I was. True. Right. And started making money faster, became a lot more successful, got consulting gigs all over the place. People liked who I was. And I ended up meeting who's now my wife, the name Sophia. In? In New York, New York. On a consulting job, working, you know, in this marketing space. And uh, I thought she dropped dead gorgeous. I was like, oh, I like you. She didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> it happens and eventually we eventually we finally got together but um she opened my mind up to a different way of looking at the world you know i always thought that i had to do things a very specific way i had to walk down a very specific path and when she opened my eyes and she's like you don't have to do the world this way you don't have to always like be what your father was you don't have to always be what your mother said you should be or what this job or that job is and it kind of started in the spiritual space where I started meditating because I was very much so church, like go to church, do this, this is how it's done, and so on and so forth. I always thought there was something wrong with the way church was. You did? Yeah. We can talk about that in a second, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, I always thought there was something wrong with church. Um, I don't anymore, but I'll kind of talk about what that journey looked like. And then um, 
but she, I started meditating. Then I went down this whole rabbit hole of like looking at the world differently, seeking what made sense and felt good to me spiritually because we are energetic beings Agreed. at the end of the day. Everything inside of us, when you go down to those subatomic levels and Planck scale of which you are, you literally are this vacuum fluctuation of energy that like vibrates at the same energy as the energy universe. It's like nuts, what's inside of you. And so when you understand that, that you have that inside of you, it's like, okay. And I went down this rabbit hole. I'm like, oh, well, there's got to be other answers besides, you know, this person died on this cross for this specific reason for this thing. And this is my only way to get to heaven is by worshiping that. Or if I'm Jewish, there's this, or if I'm Muslim, I'm this. I'm like, why are there so many different versions of it? And there's really only one God that says that we can get there. And so that ended up breaking my entire cycle, but then it took me down these rabbit holes of spirituality. And then I, you know, you find your way into all kind of shit plant medicine, crazy meditation retreats, dead ayahuasca, iboga, all the mushrooms you could possibly think of, 5-MeO, DMT, fucking ketamine. <laughs> Done the whole gambit. Oh, this, and that happened three years ago. Oh, so, that three years. So that happened three years ago. And two years ago, it all broke. Like the whole construct of what I thought I was. It was like I was like from the sexual abuse to the incarceration to all these other things that happened that was... You know, I got out of prison when I was 33. All of that that happened up to that period of time was like all of this breaking mm. to myself. Then I got really sick with thyroid disease. Then um, got in another marriage, you know, that was like number three. And Third marriage. That was my third marriage at that time. Yeah. I'm in number four now. Okay. Never again. Right? Yeah. And this is it, you know, because I actually love myself and reflected that into another person, but we can talk about that too. That's good. <laughs> Right. Yeah. But I didn't love myself in these other marriages. And I created this vacuum to have these other people in my life that filled a gap from these abuse cycles that I was in growing up. Yeah. Right. So these people were like my saviors. And of course I was just kept repeating the cycle over and over again and just finding it in different versions of people. Mm. Okay. So what Sophia did was help me open my mind to that. But then as you're changing, you end up having to like break yourself down so much. And so then you end up finding different practices and protocols. I would be a guy that would meditate for two hours a day. I would then turn back around and then do like crazy breath work stuff. I was reading every book that I could possibly get my hands on around spirituality, right? And it was all like to get to this version of myself. I didn't realize it at the time, but I became this judgmental asshole that was calling people out if they weren't patient or in their heart or um, they weren't meditating. They didn't have a practice, that kind of thing. I heard that that can happen. Yeah, it happens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you start dabbling in this stuff. Yeah, you, the judgment phase does you come up. Become hella judgmental, and you say, "Oh, you don't get it." Like, and so and just and that can happen with people that go to church. No, yeah, hundred percent. You go to church and you think you're better than everybody else. Yeah, exactly. It's no different. Once you have something else to point to that's not you, mm -hmm. then you start to use that thing in order to point at other people, mm -hmm. right? And so then those people feel bad. They feel unseen. It's like this whole process you take individuals through, and it defeats the purpose yeah. of all your work. Yeah, and you're not even loving yourself in the process. And so I didn't love myself in those windows of time. And then I did all this plant medicine and that was in 2022. And, uh, the whole like system kind of like broke for me. And then I went to this thing called the Hoffman process. Heard about that. Yeah. Out really. in California. Yeah. California. Yeah. And you go and you become very aware of all of your negative self love pattern. That's okay. good. You pick up from your parents. There are 500 on a list. There are 200 and I had 296 negative self-love patterns out of 500 that I was able to map to my parents. I had one myself that I had created. Mm. So I'm like, oh, well, that's crazy. That I get from them so I can actually let that go. So you go through all of this. You learn how to let the trauma, traumatic patterns go. And then you become hyper aware of if I'm choosing to pick my parents' trauma or am I choosing to actually pick myself. Yeah. Then when you pick yourself, you're not picking your parents and you have a clean slate. And then you start to think differently. You're like, oh, this is, I don't have to react based on the program that I've been taught of how to, if somebody were to run in the room right now and, you know, say, you know, we could use, you know, a lot of guys and women, some hot shit comes in the room right now. Yeah. And most guys would be like, you know, and she starts hitting on you and you're in a relationship or you're married. How do you react? Right. Me. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a lot of guys would be like, oh, what? question. Yeah. Well, I'd be, I like this, right? They'd be like, I like this, and so on and so forth. You know, for me, it's like, oh, well, this is a, this is a, I created this moment as a phase of initiation for me to be continually loyal to the covenant of my wife. 
So I can bring in any hot woman. They could be ass naked and walk in this room and I would be like, thank you, I appreciate it, but I have an agreement that this isn't going to exist. And I would send them on their way. Yeah. Right? right? And so like, if I were to indulge in that, then I'm out of integrity with this container that I've built, which means if I do one thing one way, I do all things that way. Mm. And then the whole system breaks. So what would happen after Hoffman is if I did something that was out of integrity, that was similar to my father's trauma that he passed along to me or my mother's trauma, everything in my life was fucked up. When I was walking in integrity of the life I created, everything was beautiful. So then you learn how, this is why I wear this razor blade on my neck, because you learn how to walk this tightrope, this like really fine line of your personal integrity, which is only your life. And then everything else starts to fold into it and it makes this really beautiful journey. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, There's it's, a lot in it's, there. It's a lot to process. Yeah. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> I, I can fire hose you. Like it, it just goes. It's, it's great. Yeah. Um, what I like about the Hoffman process uh-huh. is that it's able to so granularly identify all yeah. these traits. Yeah. Like what kind of work do you think that they had to do to be able to map that out in people? Oh, dude. Like they, they tell the story um, a little bit, but I mean, it's, it's a lot. I mean, you, yeah. you like, I think you just had to, I don't know. They, they go through and they just like, what did you experience from your parents? You know I mean? There was stuff on there. Like, did your parents leave pornography on the coffee table? And that was in there. And that happened to me. I was like, this is fucking nuts that this is actually in the thing. Okay. Let's, let's talk about that one piece then. Yeah. You check the box. Yes. Yeah. Then what? Well, now you become aware. So the, the four stages of transformation is awareness. Yeah. Expression. So I have to be able to talk about it. Most people, they're aware of their shit. They don't talk about it. They don't get it out. And you have to. You have to get it out. step two. Right. Okay, very good. And a lot of individuals intellectually can communicate about it, but they don't emotionally communicate about it. So what do you mean? So intellectually, I can be like, oh, this, like I can go to a therapist and be like, oh, this happened to me and I'll have the conversation and this ping pong back and forth. And so I'm expressing it intellectually, but emotionally I still hold it. I have this emotional feeling about what it is. So I haven't emotionally let it go. Right. Okay. And that generally centers around your, like your, your inner child. So your inner child is this emotional creature that was like fucked up as a kid mm-hmm. because of your parents, what they taught it. And they hold on to it because it kept them safe. Yes. Because as a child, you go back to your parents and say, oh, if your parents say, oh, act this way, <clears throat> because I need you to do this. You're like, oh, well I get fed. I get affirmed if I act this way around my mom and dad, this is what I do. So like I keep doing these things over and over again. And then I build a system of safety after my parents' trauma based on what they told me is right or wrong. And it's not necessarily the truth. That's the ego, isn't it? It's the ego ish. Yeah. It's the ego and it's a patterning recognition. And then it's this inner child that ends up holding on to it because they don't want to be hurt again. And so then you do this whole thing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then you grow up in it and then the inner child's inside of you. And that's where your emotions flare up. That's when you become reactive in your emotions. It's like somebody comes in and does something rude to you or says a word to you that reminds you of your father. And therefore you just basically react as a child and then you just do the thing again. But it kept you safe as a kid because you saw how your mom and dad reacted that way. You saw what it was like, well, if I do this with my dad, I'm going to actually be okay. If my dad does this to his friends or his work colleagues, or I go on a drive with them and he's being a dick to the people at work, but he's successful because he's got a car and money and he's be able to buy me Jordans and stuff. I must be able, that's how I, that's how I function. So I'm going to be this asshole. Let's dive into this a little bit here. Okay. (laughs) Let's say, let's say for example, somebody's dealing with some kind of traumatic thing Uh and it's showing up in their adult life Uh and they're doing things that are not in, in integrity. Uh-huh. It's affecting other people. If you were to um, teach that process of healing uh-huh. to a five-year-old, uh-huh. how would you teach them to heal from whatever trauma that they've experienced in their childhood? So teach it, teach the five-year-old inside of the adult, or uh, teach uh, the five-year-old. Let, as a five-year-old? Let's say you're like, "Hey, kid, if you when you grow up, yeah, you might notice yourself acting out in some ways." Mm-hmm. This is how you heal from whatever you might go through. Mm, Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, so so what I would tell them is, you know, one, one is you go through life, become aware of who you're getting your information from and how is it making you feel, Mm -hmm. right? 
Because a child, you don't know, like you're just a vessel, like a, a child is just this little vessel of receivership that's just taking on anything. So they're just like, eh, I don't really know how to choose. Right. Right. And then you become, you know, 13, 14, you start choosing. That's why you become an asshole to your parents because you're calling bullshit on their system. And that's what adolescence is. Right. But well said. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's like, oh, I don't like what my parents are doing. There's something wrong with what they taught me. I don't know what. Now I'm going to go venture with my friends and figure this other thing out. But if I were to say as a child is just become, just be aware. Okay, you got to be aware, and if if you could write it all down of the experiences that you have, be like, oh, this is like what my father was like, this is what my mother was like, and who do I want to be, right? And then at which point, make sure that you're talking about things. Don't hold it in. If you don't like something, say it. You know, my grandmother used to tell me, if you don't like it, don't eat it, just throw it out the window. Like, I'd rather you tell me you hate it, right, <laughs> than sit there and try to take it down and hold it in. That's good. Yeah. And she was, you know, super wise. And that was a thing about just. Was she? Yeah. 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 Where'd she live? She's in Dallas, dude. Yeah. Okay. What yeah. made her so wise? I mean, just some of the, I mean, the stuff she went through. Um, she lost a daughter, you know, uh, one of her, you know, when you live, I can't imagine being a parent losing a 16 year old, but losing a child. Dang. Um, so she lost her daughter when her daughter was 19. Um, you know, she had, a, I mean, in, inside of black communities, a lot of infidelity. Mm-hmm. It's probably everywhere, but. It was all in my family, very rampant from all of the men and everything else. And so she had to deal with that. Um, she made it a point to to showcase her wisdom mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. All the time, yeah. That's great. Yeah, all the time, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so she'd have these really interesting sayings. But, you know, that was one of them I remember. But I would rather my child just tell me, like, hey, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good to me. And right. get the child and to be in touch with their feelings at an intellectual level with their emotions at their child level, right? Mm-hmm. And how things show up in their body. Okay. Right? So when you're in a situation and it's like, oh, that doesn't feel good to me, where do you feel that at? Or that does feel good to me, where do you feel that at? And you use your body as a tool in order to create recognition of what's going on in your life. Because your body is like this fucking supercomputer. If you imagine technologically how we're built. Yeah. It's bananas. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like it's like the they have this calculation um, on the math of God where they talk about uh, if you were to take 155 DNA sequences that were high, that were functioning, mm-hmm. right? So that means that everything is mapped sequentially in the way that it would actually function. The probability of that existing in, the, in just 155 sequences is like one, like finding a needle stack in, a, in the size of the galaxy, one trillion galaxies the size of, a mil, of the, the Milky Way, like a, like a needle in a, in a haystack. It's like Literally. that small and that finite. Okay. Freaking A. So it's like, okay, well, if that's the case, we have 90,000 sequences of DNA. This is 155. You know, I could send you the thing. It's fucking nuts. Yeah. There's math on it. Yeah, I see. It. Yeah. And so the probability that we're an accident or that we're some like, you know, flimsy thing running, running around here without some very specific intention built on it is like not there, not, not a thing. <laughs> yeah. When you think about how many species there are in the whole world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And think about what we're capable of compared to yeah. all those other species. It's wild. Yeah. 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 And so, and so with that, you know, what the body can do, we're not even close like to understanding what we're capable of and how we can, you know, which is why when they, you know, you hear about these miracles like in the Bible or old ancient civilizations, I absolutely know that that was real. And we can do that today. We've just observed ourselves into these like lackluster versions of human beings. I'd like to ask you why. We've just got to continue teaching this five-year-old. <laughs> okay, we'll keep teaching the five-year-old. How to heal. So you talk yeah, but to that, That's part speak of it. Speak your though. mind. Speak your mind, understand your emotions, and feel it in your body. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, feel the feelings. Feel the feelings. That's they're meant to be felt, not emotions are taught feelings, they're not feeling. In your work space, does the term agency come up often? Or like standing in your agency and things along those lines? A little bit. Okay. You know, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, I think it, I mean, I, I feel like it's, there's nothing that's overused. I just feel like it's been, you know, turned into a thing. Um, no, we don't but, want that. but I mean, it's fine. It's like, I would call it more sovereignty, you know, standing in your truth. Okay. Um, we can call that agency at the same point. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just, yeah, it gets used a lot. All right. Now we're going back to that last thing we were talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm drawing a blank on it. But why? Which part? What were we just talking about before that, man? 
<laughs> oh my god, we're freaking blazing a rail today. I need a notepad up in here. Um, no, I think we were talking about the uh, the like the the body and what it's capable of, and the math of God associated and, with and it. And why do you think us humans turn it into to what it is today? Yeah, you like think so? the, what were this lackluster version? Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's have you, have you studied like Atlantis or any of these things? Or? I don't know. I haven't studied Atlantis. That's why I'm know. talking to you. <laughs> I'm a real estate agent, bro. <laughs> okay. All right. You, you know the Bible, though. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. And um, you, know, you look at like these, you know, Moses and, you know, the the Red Sea. Yeah. Or the burning bush or manna from heaven or all these miracles that are out there. There's a moment in time where, think think about it like this. If I observe you as a limited version of yourself. And I come to you and I judge you and I tell you what you are and are not. How does that feel? Not good. Right. If you do that to me, it doesn't feel good either, right? right? Unless I really know myself and I'm like, man, this is just this guy's shit, right? And I can still stand in my stock, okay? And now imagine you put 10 people in a room and they're doing that to each other. Okay, what are the, what kind of energy are they putting on, on one another? It's negative. It's right, a lot of negative energy. Yeah. Now, if you think about society and what we've been teaching ourselves over the years, even from a systematic school perspective, schools look like prisons, mm-hmm. right? And then you turn back around and you say, okay, well, this is what we've built ourselves into this fear-based cycle of like what success means is that I've got to work my ass off in order to actually make anything happen. Yeah. Okay. And then you have these like constant cycles of reindustrialization of humanity, these geopolitical climates, you've got wars that are popping up and all of this misinformation that's being bombarded onto us and malinformation, which might be true, but it's intended to us in a very specific way. Energetically, what we're receiving and what we're consuming, what we're taking in is literally killing us just from what we're observing. And so then what do we do is we pass it on to other people. We don't even deal with our traumatic shit with our parents. We create these constant cycles. And so therefore me actually being able to be a miracle is constantly being negated by what's happening in the life outside of me. Because I think this is more real than who I am. Because I think this is more real than who I am. Yeah. What does it take to get an understanding of who you are? It's, so we talked to, when we first got here, we are three-dimensional beings, okay? What I see you as right now is you're like a two-dimensional version. I don't know the depth of you at all. I uh, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and most people don't know the depth of themselves because we're looking outside of us as that two-dimensional world mm-hmm. that feels somewhat three-dimensional, right? But I don't even know the depth of this bottle until I drink the water out of it, right? I don't know the depth of this table until I tear the thing apart and I look at what's inside of it. I just trust that there's something there, but I'm trusting just the facade of what I see. Yeah. So our entire life literally is built off of an understanding of a facade. Okay. But you've got to, you've <clears throat> got to have snippets of truth along the way. Well, there's what is truth. What is truth? Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the question. Damn it. I mean, do I mean really like what is like what, what, what is the truth about this? What the water in this bottle? Okay. You don't know. Even when you drink it, you don't know you trust that there's no truth in it, hmm. Hmm. right? You don't know how many H2O molecules there are inside of this. You're just kind of trusting the fact, is it dirty? Is it not? Is it a bacteria? Does it not? What's the truth of it? You trust that it's really clean, Saratoga water, <laughs> <laughs> which you have no idea. Great point. Right? Okay. And so even, so, the, but that bottle of water knows itself. It doesn't question itself. It knows itself. It knows what's inside of it. It understands what it is. If it had a little brain that was sitting on the top and it would be like, okay, this is me and I know everything about me. Is it a lifelong journey to know oneself? It is a life, not necessarily. It is a moment in time of a choice to be able to know oneself because you create from the inside out. So you take all your life experiences and you no longer live as a victim of them. Yeah. Right. You become a creator, but you're not creating more victims. You're creating more creators in your life. You have this constant infusion of self-love that's inside of you at every core of your body. You know every piece of you from your pinky toenail, you know, all the way to what's happening on your back hamstring to every aspect of your body. And you feel that on a daily basis. And then you also become so aware of it that you have the ability to heal it because you know you so well. And then you love you so well. Is that possible? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. Says who? Says, I mean, why not? Like, I've done it to myself. I have. Okay. I literally have my thyroid radiated, 
And I'm supposed to probably be a pretty heavy person right now because I have hypothyroidism. Mm. I don't take any medication for it yeah. at all, but I produce the right amount of T3 in my body in order to maintain. It's a choice. That's good. Right. I have two vote broken vertebrae in my lower back, but I can go and run up and down the street and deadlift and bench press and do all the things that I had literally slit my wrist trying to take my life. These two hands, I couldn't have picked up this bottle. Everything was numb, mm. but it's finally come back. Because you say, well, fuck it. Like, why not? We've only been told that it can't. Yeah. So could you not just self-regenerate and then figure out what that looks like? Each of us has this inside of it. I know it sounds crazy, but this is the miracle of the human body. It's the miracle of the mind. It's truly mind over matter, but the mind is not this brain. The mind is your bar- your brain and your heart coming together in order to create a, an abundant life for yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody to push pause and then <laughs> repeat what he just said. Six times over, because that's really good. It's really good. It's the different way of viewing the world. Yeah, and I think that we do need to look at the world differently. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah, because I think a lot of the times we're stuck in a box. We are. Yeah. So now you'd round. And the world, yes, yeah. But then, so you take the whole concept of um, who we are as human beings and then you say, if I don't know the depth of me, how can I create any miracle? Because I'm looking at something else to create the miracle around me and nothing will create your life but you. Yeah. Nothing will create a miracle in your life but you. And so then what ends up happening is that once you can actually stand in that, you become a walking miracle. Then what happens is, you know, you take the concept of, you know, Yeshua or Christ or Jesus, whatever you want to call him, and his disciples, that what are they doing? There's 12 people that are observing this individual as his most abundant self. So he's observing them as their most abundant self and they're observing him as his most abundant self. There's no accident there's 12 months in the year, right? There's no accident that there's 12 astrological signs. There's no accident that these 12 people are observing this one person that they call the sun, right? Fucking weird. But the, all this stuff, it corresponds to one another. And so now he has a little collective that is observing him into his most abundant being and so therefore he can perform miracles because he has nothing stopping him from seeing him as a miracle worker. Right? Mo- but, mo- yeah. Modern day. Yeah. How do you do this? Miracle worker. Mm-hmm. Where are they? To every one of us. Right. Right. It's the choice of when we, when we, when we know we love ourselves so much yeah. and we know how to walk in that, what'll happen is, is those disciples will start to surround you. You're never a messiah. Right, that that's not a thing. Even what Jesus was talking about wasn't that. It's we collectively come together, we make a change. Yeah. Right. So we're two or more gathered. There I am, and therefore, if I have twelve or more gathered, it becomes really interesting. We all observe each other into these type of containers, and this is why I like what the work that you're doing is so important. When you have a collective that knows who we are, we're not propagating fear, fear, misogynism, patriarchy. We have a balance of the things that we're doing. What'll happen is, is the person at the center of that container will be a miracle worker to those that are outside of it. And those that are outside of it will be a miracle worker to the, that person at the center of it. So you as a leader of this, the responsibility is to have an aspect of integrity to be able to create that container. Those that are observing you inside of this 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 container itself can see you as that miracle because they know who you are. And then the whole thing just turns into like a really magical container, ecosystem, whatever you want to call it. When you say magical, right, because... It seems like you could have been talking about a business environment right there. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. What about in a case such as Enron? Mm-hmm. Okay. It was a very successful company. And I'm sure it had the same effect, mm-hmm. right? Where people were looking up to the leaders, et cetera. Right. Those, those leaders were takers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it collapsed. Mm-hmm. So what would we say about something like that, which is the contrast to... to um, what we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. So uh, what is success, number one? So you have to kind of redefine that. And if we look at success as this monetary thing that's taking place, then, you know, we can say sex trafficking is, is successful because they make a lot of money. Mm. They make more money probably than fucking Enron. Like if you really think about the fucking business itself, it's... Well, I haven't checked into it, but <laughs> I'm sure. Drug dealing. You know, these guys, these... Nice. Yeah, great money, right? Yeah. Is that success? For them. Right. It's dark success. Well, yes, Enron was dark success. Yeah. Okay. It's no different because if you're doing anything to create energy that's out of integrity of the benefit of all people, then you're not successful. 
you're hurting somebody. If you hurt anybody along the way, you're not successful. Right. Because that's a I state. I'm looking at me. I'm not looking at we. I'm looking at, oh, I need to do this for me. And then at some point, the house of cards comes tumbling down. House of Cards. Mm -hmm. Television show. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sean, you're from Dallas. Yes. Then you went to New York. Yeah. Uh, and then you moved here. So Dallas, New York, Atlanta, L.A., then here. Atlanta, L.A., here. Yeah. But the New York to Atlanta to L.A., then here, was within a short amount of time. It was, uh, right. yeah, it was, what, 2020, well, 2020, 2019 was Thank New you. York. Yeah. Yeah, then it uh, ended up in Myrtle Beach for a second. That was weird. In the middle of COVID. Were you golfing? No, I was... No, that was, that was a weird story. We were, you know, like you couldn't do and you couldn't fly in COVID at certain points. And so yeah. um, me and Sophia, we got a car with my son and we drove from New York all the way down the coast when it's our family in Atlanta, which is why we ended up living there. It was like, oh, we'll live here with our family for a little bit. It's nice. And then we uh, were driving back up to New York to take the car back and go back to our apartment. She's like, I want to go to a beach. And we went in Myrtle Beach and it act like COVID had never happened there. Right. And then we ended up getting a beach house. Some state. Yeah. They had it going on. <laughs> <laughs> that in Florida. Yeah, that in Florida. Florida's like COVID didn't even happen. Yeah, I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Especially compared to LA. Oh, yeah, it was not. It's like the opposite. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Go you were you were in LA? No. No, okay. But I just know. California? Mm -hmm. It was like, a, like being in prison. Yeah. New York was the same way. New York was like, it got better um, at the end where they were, they took everything from the restaurants out to the streets. Yeah. And then they now had like, you know, what you kind of see now when you go to New York, like all the street eating Mm. That was all the tables outside and, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let me ask you this, mm -hmm. all right? We got to dive into a little bit about uh, wh where, you, where you came from. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is you grew up in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what your first house looked like? I remember, yeah. I remember, well, not the first, first one because we were in an apartment, but I remember the, the one we had in Duncanville, yeah. yeah. Duncanville. Duncanville. Don't come through. Mm -hmm. Did you take the bus to school? Well, I do. I wasn't going to school at that time. Well, I was five years old. We went to Richardson, and okay. then we lived um, like six blocks away from the school, so I'd walk to school. You did, yeah. When you got back home from school growing mm -hmm. up, what was your your feelings when you opened the door to your house and walked in inside? My feelings, emotions, or feelings? What the hell? <laughs> she cut it out. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I discern them differently, but the emotion. I want to discern them differently. Yeah, I mean the the, the teach me how to do that. No, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, the the emotions that I felt. I mean, emotions. Yeah, the emotions. Um, it depends on what age I was at. So up till nine years old, they were really um, exciting. You know, like I would be excited to get home. I was excited to be around my parents. Um, and he had a brother, a sister. I had a little sister. Two yeah. sisters. You and sister. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was younger. How much younger? Uh, three years. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You get home and everything's a good time. Everything's up a good time. Up until your night. Up until night. What are, what are some some of your best memories up until your night? Uh, what do you remember doing? What I remember doing. Uh, I mean, I remember just like it was interesting. I remember playing Nintendo. Yep. Right. Um, that yeah. was a, that was a vibe. It's probably a big deal. Big deal. Did uh, you get that as a Christmas present by chance? I got it. Yeah, I got it at Christmas. I think everybody got Did it. Did you lose your fit? But... I didn't lose my shit, but I was I was okay. I was happy to have it. Yeah, uh, I played with a lot of had those like Star Wars action figures. Big Star Wars guy. Yeah, big Michael Jackson fan. Um, I would just dance like you know do the whole Michael Jackson dancing thing. Yeah, um, you know all of that. Uh, I'm trying to think what else we do. Uh, I'd go outside and uh, play football in the streets with my friends. That was weird because we were playing on concrete. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what do they call that? The concrete jungle. Yeah, concrete jungle of, of of Richardson. Richardson. I mean, you know, we just it was just a wide street, and there weren't a lot of cars, and we just you know everybody's yards. Parents like get out of my yard because yeah, they were overly landscaped, so we were just like out in the street playing. Is Richardson, a nice part of town. I don't, I've never been there. It's decent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, back then it was like the I don't know how to put it for Austin. I mean, it's I mean it was suburb, you know, area, um, but it was nice. It's still nice. Okay. Yeah. So you, you're, uh, everything's great up until you're nine years old. And what, what changed? Uh, the sexual abuse started happening. 
and nine uh, from a family member uh, whenever I'd go to California. And so then that started to like tear the walls down of like your, who you are, your concept of safety. Um, and, you know, not being able to, not talking about it. Like you didn't want to talk about it. You were afraid to talk about it. Like yeah. this is a weird fucking thing that's happening to me. Mm. And that happened until I was about 13 years old mm-hmm. and over and over again. And that ended up setting a different trajectory of, I need to go and like seek affirmation from the world because I don't feel seen. Like I don't feel like seen or heard. Um, so then you get good at stuff. Like you get really good at football. You get good at track. You're like, Oh, I need to do all the stuff to be seen by like strong male figures because I wish I would have been seen by a strong male figure because I was basically, you know, attacked by a semi strong male figure in some capacity. And, uh, so I want somebody that's stronger to like actually see me. So I feel safe. Mm. You know, my dad was kind of like out doing his thing, you know, where he wasn't overly loyal to my mother. So he was out in the street. So I didn't really have him to lean into often. You probably didn't feel attached. I didn't feel attached to anything. No. Felt isolated. Yeah. Yeah. Let me so. Huh. Yeah. Me and my sister got along well, you know, uh, in that window of time. And um, I saw, you know, I was very close to my mother, but she was also like dealing with my father's stuff. So she wasn't present. Mm. Right. So there was all of that that was going on. And, um, the tornado. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you just seek the outside world. You do the outside world thing. And, uh, you know, I didn't get into, like, I never drank until I was 21. Right. Right. I didn't do any, you know, any drugs, anything like that. Um, you know, until I was like in my 20s. But all of that, uh, led to me, you know, here, let me get really good grades so that people look up to me, right? Or that I see I'm a firm. Let me be really good at sports. And so those, but I was small, like I was like a really small, tiny kid <laughs> until I was, no, until I was like 17, eight, no, I was 18. Mm. I was about five, two. Okay. And then I grew. Kind of small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for, I mean, to be six, two, there's, now, there's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I grew a shit ton and I, I was really skinny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, then, then the sports thing accelerated and I got a, you know, D one scholarship to run track and all this other stuff. Um, where, uh, the university of Houston. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But then I got really good scores on my SATs, got a 1590. So then I got into like Harvard and all these other schools. So I had a choice to like pick one, but I went to U of H because I wanted the, to run track and there were yeah. hot girls there and lots. And I was, I uh, went to an all boys school. So I was like, oh, this is much different than going to another private school and repeating the same thing that I was at, you know, inside of uh, St. Mark's when I was in Texas. Yeah, screw yeah. that. Yeah. I want to see a bunch of dudes all day. Yeah. I was like, I want to go all, you know, let me just flip the whole script. Yeah. <laughs> so you did. So yeah, I went to you know, U of H and did the same thing over and over again. Got married in my um, sophomore year of college. Of college, yeah. You're kidding. Yeah. What are you twenty one? Because it's like twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty one. Because I wanted to have a family. Because my family is so broken. So you see how the cycle. Yes. It's like oh, this thing happened. So I'm like oh well, like let me do something to make me feel safe, and that didn't work. Mm. You know, and then you end up being like, oh, I can be like this with feminine energy. So then you like start to manipulate feminine energy. Then, you know, not being faithful to anybody along the way. And so those types of things were taking place. And, you know, then it cascades into your 20s and you get out of college and it keeps repeating itself until you stop it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It definitely cascades. It's like a a train wreck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just keeps going. Yeah. So... Once you got out of the marriage, mm-hmm. when, how old were you then? I, mean, I was like, it was like six, seven months. Like I wasn't in that first one very long. Like mine. Yeah. Hmm? Just like mine. Yeah. It was like super fast. I was yeah. in and out. Yeah. Right. It was like, you know, but I wasn't, I was very unfaithful. You know, I was just like, oh, this isn't, how, why am I doing this? I got married out of fear and guilt. Mm. You know, her, uh, her father like baptized me, not even like her father baptized me. And then I confessed my sins to him. I'm like, I'm sleeping with your daughter. And then we got married and it was like very naive, you know, but I was like, Oh, maybe this is, this is cool. You know, but it sounded cool on paper. I mean, it was, you know, I I was chasing after something and that felt safe. And so, you know, went to this men's summer retreat and then came back, got married two weeks later. Okay. Yeah. That's how it goes sometimes. That's yeah. I wouldn't, I would, I mean, if you had, if I wouldn't change anything because I am who I am today, but if I were to like advise myself at that moment in time, it would be a different set of advice. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. So you got out of that marriage. Mm -hmm. Where did you move to after college? Uh, I went back to Dallas. Um, 
got a job in medical staffing, did hmm. that for, you know, what was it? Um, like a recruiting job? Recruiting job, yeah. yeah. Medical staffing recruiting job. Okay. 30K coming out. First job, you know, and then uh, was the fastest to VP in six months. Um, so I ended up making a couple hundred thousand dollars my first year out of school. Good. Yeah, because you know, I was just out calling. I did the Kobe Bryant thing. I was like, I'm just going to outwork everybody. Right. And I just, they were, they were making 150 calls. I'll make 400 calls a day. I'll make 500 calls a day. I'll just outwork everybody because I'm afraid to lose once again. Instead of being, knowing I'm going to win, I was afraid to lose. But I created a habit off of that. And that was based off of the trauma and my sexual abuse that happened because I wanted to be seen and affirmed. So therefore, if I outperformed everybody, I would win. That makes sense. Or not lose. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I think that a lot of people are afraid to get awareness. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Because it, it's just so painful to face yourself. Mm-hmm. And yet the path to healing is to face yourself. Yeah. It's to love yourself. And taking it one step further yeah, to love and love yourself yeah yeah but you gotta you gotta face yourself to love yourself because you gotta stand in the demons and the darkness what's a practical tool somebody can take away from listening to as a first step let's say something's gnawing at them mm-hmm. or they're just not what they want to be in life or or they've got this darkness looming in the background yeah what is a first step I mean take I would people think ignorance is bliss right and it is blissful to the capacity that you know, you don't know. Okay. The, what I always do, like I have a, you know, in, in my course that I teach, I have this trauma worksheet people work through. And so you go through and you check the boxes. It's similar to the Hoffman, but a little bit different. It's shorter and to the point. Yeah. Not 300. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's shorter. Yeah. But you work through and you check the boxes of the things that you just become aware. You're like, Oh, I didn't know this. I didn't realize this about myself. I didn't realize that I took this from my parents. So generally like, it's like almost like a self audit to understand what's going on with you. Yeah. Like if you can't diagnose yourself, like if you don't know that like, Hey, I've got a bunion on my foot and you keep walking, why is my foot hurting? And I've never looked at the bottom of my foot. Well, maybe look at it and be like, Oh, there's a bunion. I just need to shave it off. Right. Right. So once you're aware of it, you can make decisions differently about it. You can choose it differently. So that's the first thing that I would, advise and I mean not everybody to take my course but like to actually understand how to do a little bit of self audit and the other thing that I would advise is for individuals to move from to reactivity to responsibility so like one thing that I do is I take total responsibility for everything in my life everything everything what's something what's one piece of life that people you notice tend to fail taking responsibility for the most uh, getting one? getting cut off by a driver drive down the street and have somebody cut you off, how do you take responsibility for that? Yeah, that's like, a common occurrence. Yeah, it's a common occurrence. Like, right. It's very hard to do. They say, like, well, it's their fault. Or taking responsibility um, in a relationship for why that person shows up the way they do. Or taking responsibility for something fucked up happening at work and you get fired. Mm-hmm. People don't take responsibility for losing their job. They're like, oh, well, they laid me off and there's this and that. My boss is an asshole and all these other things. Much. We don't take responsibility for in our relationships. We don't take responsibility for like how we see this country, right? We owe oh, it's Donald Trump or Kamala or it's Biden or it's the government or it's the Republican Party, it's the Democratic Party. Like, what is your responsibility in it? Right. Yeah. That that's a hot button for me. Don't get me started on it. <laughs> I've got a father who t- talks about politics every time I call him. Yeah. Even I'll say I don't want to talk about politics. Yeah. I'll call him up and somehow till the end of the conversation, here we go. Donald Talking Trump. about politics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, to your point, mm-hmm. take responsibility in all aspects of your life. Extreme yeah. ownership. Jocko Willing mm-hmm. promotes that. Mm-hmm. Right? I think once you're able to do that, uh, your container becomes more uh, grounded. Yeah. More structured. Yeah. And it, it, um, mm, that's good. That's good. You know, as I'm talking with you today, I'm noticing a lot of visualizations. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the different things we're covering. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, that's something that anybody can do is mm-hmm. as, as we're going through this, visualizing themselves as that energetical being that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, asking themselves, are they putting out light? Right. Are they putting out darkness? Right. Yeah. And asking themselves, what do they, who do they want to be? 
Mm-hmm. Who do they want to be? It's a very simple, fundamental question. Yeah. And yet it gets overlooked so yeah. often. Because to your point earlier, a lot of the times we're, we're told mm-hmm. how to be. Mm-hmm. We're force-fed. Mm-hmm. We're getting broken down. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Can I take that a step further? Keep going. What were you going to say? Go. No, no, go ahead. No, that was it. Okay. I'd also say, who are you? And then stand in that knowing of who you are. So there's a, you know, words are very delicate and they're like the spells we cast on ourselves. Yes. Whenever you use words like want, it means you push it away. Right. So who am I right now? Right. And can I, and can I, or will I, or do am I choosing to embody that? And can I do that with a rhythm over and over and over again with every passing second? Because what the time does is it allows us to actually step into that abundant self. We're constantly resetting ourselves, literally every second. Are we? We are. Resetting. We're resetting. You can choose to. Like I can choose, I can choose, I can choose right now to be a nut job. I can go and grab that picture, throw it on the thing, kick over your cameras and do all this crazy. I could be a nut job. You could. You could. Or I could choose not to. I could choose to like slam this table and like make monkey noises. Yeah. Right? Totally racist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like out of all the animals. You know? I know, right? I could have said raccoon too. But <laughs> just no. make your audience feel uncomfortable. Oh, this is great. <laughs> This is great. It's a new I'm one get, for us. Here. I'm getting. I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 don't make those jokes amongst your friends. Um, but not when anybody's looking. Yeah, not when anybody's looking. Yeah, yeah. Well, another don't, joke. <laughs> that is a terrible. It's a comedy podcast. I mean, there's two bears on the screen. I could have just used bears, but, um, but, um, shit. What was <laughs> like, you got yourself on that one. No, no, no. But I could choose. Literally, I could choose anything at any point. So like the comfort opportunity, I can reset myself as a person of stillness, yeah. integrity and love. I can be like, I want to be a person of fear and it's my choice. Nobody's making me do anything. Nobody, you know, even if like t- you take the story of Christ, nobody made like, if, if, if Christ is back, I'm going to go leave. I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to deal with this. I know it's going to happen. Right. I know this is coming, but I want to go and take this because nobody's going to make him not be himself. So if him being himself means being nailed to a cross, so be it. If me being myself means that I got walked out of here and got hit by a car because I was just being myself or somebody decided they were going to like, you know, fly a plane into this building right now, which would be horrific, mind you. Right. But if they did, because I'm being myself and I'm very here present with you, then so be it. Right. That's just part of life. And so if we're constantly reacting out of the fear of what's coming, right, we're making choices out of that fear and we're not being ourselves, then who are we? If you can you write down that answer? Would anybody be able to write down the answer? Who are we if we're operating out of fear? Right. Who are we? I mean, nobody can because you're not you. Right. You're you're the external mechanism that <laughs> has created you to be in reaction of it and you're not responsible for who you are. You're reacting to the world and you're like literally all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. And it all starts with awareness. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the you gotta accept it. A hundred percent. All the prophet, Christ, Buddha, fucking, you know, any of these stories that you hear about these like teachers that just kinda like existed, they just knew themselves. Mm-hmm. That's it. And we all have the capacity of that. That's why we revere them so much. We're like, oh, that was a presence. I don't know why I love that presence, why they did so much in the world, but that's a presence. I got to go and be around that. And we still want to be around it energetically, even though the person's not here anymore. So people reach out to you often. Um, most times, would you say it's on your, uh, through social media? Uh, yeah, through social media. Right. Yeah, yeah I remember yeah. you telling me that uh, the first time I met you. And when they reach out, what are they ultimately looking for? Um, they're just looking for help. Looking, like, for help. looking for looking for answers. They're like, "How do you know this information? How can I know this information?" Yeah, you know, like, okay, well, I'll teach it to you. Like, for what I for what I can, what you want, what you're receiving, you'll turn it into your own version. How do you classify the information that you share? Uh, like in a category. Yeah. Um, it's like you know, spiritual abundance stuff. Like it's uh, you know, like I've taken, you know, read, you know, everything and from you know. Jewish mysticism to Christianity to Buddhism, um, you know, went to the temples in Japan at Mount Fuji and, you know, hung out with them and yeah, you chanted. Did. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, 
uh, you know, Hin- Hinduism, um, all, you know, all these different like ancient kind of like things that live out there practices. And then I then studied all this quantum physics stuff. And then you see there's a correlation between both of them. And then I mathematically put them together, how they actually fit. And then that's what I teach. Hmm. Yeah. Mathematically put them together. Who? What? Yeah. What are you talking about? So there's. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're gone. <laughs> Full four k It's just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, so um, there are, there are only nine numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right. Yeah. And then you combine them to make other numbers. Right. Right. So yeah. it's like 1.234, but it's only, there's only nine numbers. Like if you know all the letters in the alphabet, right, you know all the words because they construct themselves out of letters, right? If you know all the, these nine numbers, then you can construct infinity. Okay. So those nine numbers are like your base system that you work off of. Okay. And inside of that, you have these, what they call, you know, we've been left these clues, these different dimensions. There's 3D. Oh, this thing is depth with height, right? You know, with uh, with the height and depth. You have a fourth dimension. Google it. Fourth dimension is time, past, present, future. Okay. Fifth dimension is spirit. Right. Sixth dimension is this is even why they number six. They try to keep it away from whoever they are. Um, keep it away from you. Like six 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 is a bad number. What they say, right? Yeah. It's like the devil's number, but that's actually God's plan for you inside of the, the sixth dimension once you actually hit that sixth dimension yeah you start channeling the divine plan for your life for you your individual plan so this is like that container the number seven is very key because inside of seven there's seven days of creation it gives you a map of literally how to go from yourself into what we call a we state so once you get into that seventh dimension there's like these seven hermetic laws there's seven colors of the rainbow there's seven continents seven oceans seven body systems like the seven's fucking everywhere. And so this whole key of seven allows you to understand how to go from being this person of self into how do I go into we eight. There's no accident that eight is looks like a fucking infinity sign. Okay. Because that's the dimension of we, <clears throat> the me being able to see the world through my eyes, the eyes of another, me be able to see me as you see me and I see you. Right. Yeah. And the way that everybody sees everybody like Cerebro and fucking X-Man seeing the whole thing all at once. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the ninth dimension, you take this six, you flip it upside down, you end up with a nine, and that's the actual plan of the divine, of all, of God's plan for everything. And so all of those dimensional understandings live, and this is all just taught through different religions, teach different pieces of these things. And you fit them all together, right. and you're like, oh, well, this is, when I see nine over and over again, this is what this means, right? And then if you go deeper into like... Yeah, what's, what's his name there? Not, not te- yeah, Tesla. Tesla, three six nine. He, he, he developed the the three six nine keys of the universe. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So when you see the the two 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 three yeah. three three, those are your uh, your angel numbers. Angel numbers. Yeah. yeah. I have a whole video out about this. Yeah, I'll send it to you. And <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Because yeah, even one one one, you take those three numbers, you add it up to equal three. Two two two, you add two 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 up, it equals six. Three 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 equals nine. Four 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 equals twelve. One plus two is three. Yes. Right, four 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 is no. So four 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 is um. Tw- no, sorry, we just did four four four. Five 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 is sixteen. I'm oh, sorry, fifteen. One plus five is six. Right. Right. Seven 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 is twenty one. You're back at three again. Right. So like you see, it like keeps going. Mm. Right. But the you know six 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 is eighteen. One plus eight is nine. Right. So it's always three six nine over and over again, which is the angel numbers. Is an entire depiction of that. Yeah, and and, and who said it best? Um, three six nine, damn booty fine. There you go. Booty shake it, suck it, take it one more time. <laughs> I think it was Little John. Get low. Yeah. Was that Get Low or was that the Yin Yang Twins? It was one, no, it was, it was Little John. Was it? Little John and the Yin Yang Twins Yin-Yang. and Get Low. Yeah. Yeah. So even he's onto something. Yeah, he's onto something. Exactly. Okay, very good. Yeah. He's educated. He is. He is. Now, let, let's swing it back here. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Yeah. The math gets is anything, interesting. Is there anything else to tie that off? Because I, mean, I, I got to ask you about yeah. your experience in the FP, in the big house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can go down that plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I hear that it can be uh, a life changing experience for the better because you have so much time to think. Mm-hmm. What would you say the number one benefit of doing that, going through that experience, was for you? For me, it was moving out of judgment and understanding what justice means. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, like, when you go through the system, you get judged and it doesn't feel good. 
it was no matter what your intentions were. And my intentions when all of this happened was not to hurt anything. I didn't even actually do the thing that benefited the person that did the thing. I was the one trying to fix the thing. Mm -hmm. So like I ended up trying to like go through this process of actually fixing this other person's issues and fucked my life up because of it, which is fine. And then you get judged because of it and you really don't have any options. You can't fight the federal government. They have a 98% conviction rate that's full of federal employees that are going to sit there and be like, oh yeah, sure. You know, and, you know, <laughs> and for me, I, um, you know, I mean, I told him everything when they came into my house, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's all the stuff. And so I, I was complicit in these things and, oh, you're really honest. I'm like, well, yeah, I don't, I never got detention, right? Mind you, much less got in trouble. But, um, but what I will say is that after being judged, you understand like justice is just balance. You know, you go into this place with a ton of individuals who have committed crazy ass crimes. You know, there are, you know, I, you name it, you know, guys in there with full gold teeth that would, you know, fucking break you. Right. Um, yeah. Buddy of mine, you know, swastikas all over him. Right. And I ended up getting actually pretty cool with this guy. Um, yeah. Your old buddy, Tim. <laughs> We're just even. It's a white guy name. Stephen JC, super cool oh, guy. JC. Yeah, super cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, but you end up, um, yeah, you, know, you end up just seeing everybody for who they really are and who they, them living vulnerably in their mistakes, them losing their families, um, them not seeing their kids, them watching their children grow up through letters and visits. Yeah people in there for 25, 30 years who, you know, that's just their life and they become present in it and they live this like abundant, they love who they are. They do. Yeah. They're able to find that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see that happen and they almost prefer to be in there than be out in the world because that's now their life. Like it turns into their life. And that process of acceptance is a really beautiful thing because they're no longer living in lack of what's outside of them. They're there and they are making that space, the most abundant space they can be. Going throughout your day, mm -hmm. you said there's emotions and then what's the other thing? Emotions, intellect. Um, I asked you, how did you feel when you walked in your front door as a kid? Oh, emotions said, or feelings. Oh, emotions or feelings. Yeah. Um, which of those two? Mm -hmm. If you were to pick your emotion and you'd pick your feeling, would you like to exude the most, feel the most, what have you, uh, every single day? The most. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, um, there, so I, I generally speak less in dualistic frameworks, like most or more. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate but, that. And yeah. You should. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, when you make more of something, you make less of another. Yeah. We literally create hell off of our need to have more. And want or more and want and most dirty and all these other things. Dirty yeah, I mean, there we use them right as reference points, but it's still one of those things where the the feeling that I feel or that I choose to feel every day is just the feeling of bliss and harmony. Right, right. It's a feeling that is not really an emotion, right? Because emotions are just top feelings, and so for me, it's not not being emotional. It's being able to take the emotion and alchemize that emotion from other people. So becoming an empath, you've heard of this before, mm -hmm. where I can take people's feelings in, turn them back into something, hand that back to them in this really beautiful package, and say, "Hey, this is your gift," and you help them see themselves through those experiences. And even if it's not something that you verbally do, you emotionally or you um, energetically do it. Yeah. And so you see like the homeless person on the street that's going through something. You just like, oh, I feel that. And then I love them. And then I send something back to them. And so that blissful harmony, you feel it in your heart, yeah. right? You feel it throughout your body. You don't feel disconnected at any point. You feel grounded. You feel safe, right? You feel, um, you know, you sense things, you know, because you appreciate everything. Like the, you know, they talk about sensuality as like a sexual thing, but it's actually just sensing you sense the world. Like you're like, Oh, I can sense this table that feels cool ish. Right. Until my hands on it too long. Right. Yeah. Or the air, or what I'm breathing or the water. And then you take that in and you just really have this sensual experience of life. Right. And then the motion things is how can I take the emotions of everything in my life and be like, Oh, that person was screaming. And then you take that in and you do something with it and you watch it change. And it's like really beautiful seeing it shift like inside of your purview because it's for you to experience not to run away from. Yeah, folks, I really hope you got a notepad out for this one. 
<laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Put a push pause, go back to the beginning, get your kind of paper out. <laughs> We're getting educated today. It's fantastic. Thank you, dude. Now, I could tell that you you are passionate mm -hmm. about everything that you do. You're mm -hmm. intentional about everything you do. Now, guys, guys and girls, Sean's a busy person, right? You got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. You got your your um uh main umbrella company and then the four branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thirty five people yeah. they are responsible for in a sense. Um what what had you come on this podcast and and share your like like what is the message that had you decide to come on this podcast to share? Oh, what is the message? Oh, it's just be me. Just be you. I mean, there's no um I'd say there's a there's a message to take away from this it's you know we 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 all are connected okay whether you look at it through business whether you look at it through personal relationships whether you look at it through you know the chaos in life that we experience and we have the opportunity to choose to come together or to stay apart mm. and if we come together as a collective we have the ability to save a lot of things in this world if we choose to stay apart we're just going to continue to do this dumb shit and hurt ourselves. And we see how that shows up in life. And it's as simple as a choice to do anything right now. And if we choose to do that, great. We don't. So I would say that's my mission too, is just for whoever I can impact to help any one of us remember that collectively, if you want to use the term, collectively we're the Messiah, we're here to save the world. Collectively, we are healers here to love each other back into the abundant wholeness of ourselves. Collectively, we are magical fucking people. We are not logical people. We are we are not logicians, right? We're magicians, right? And we are here to move beyond the linear frameworks that have kept us stuck in the past and, the, and move into this present moment and become abundant beings. You should. <laughs> oh, my God. 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 Just, man, this is like, this is one of those real thought-provoking podcasts. I don't get this every day. No. Well, you know, it's like I'm it's like I'm in class, okay? Mm -hmm. And 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 I I swear, I feel like a big time student right now. And this is just gold, man. No this is great. Like whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. um it's so uh positively driven. Mm -hmm. And whenever you speak, right? There's a there's this incredible education piece to it. In the short, you can say like a few things and it's like, wait, hold on a minute. Let me think. The fact that you have the ability, this is where I'm going with this. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> the fact that you have the ability to uh, provoke so much thought mm -hmm. is your, one of your superpowers. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. That's where I'm going with that. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Uh, okay. Whew. All right. Sean. Yeah. How do people touch base with um, then go to my Instagram, which is um, Abundance10,000. Yeah. So you can go there, check it out. Um, if you're not a social media person, if you do the LinkedIn thing, just write in my name, Sean Clayton. Mm. Um, you can find me there. I post more businessy types of things on there. It's all it's all converging. It's all getting weird, which is awesome. Um, I'm pushing out, a, doing more on YouTube now. Um, so there'll be more long form content there. And, um, you know, if you need marketing services, there's myosin.io, M-Y-O-S-I-N.io. You can check us out and dig into the site, see if there's something there for you. Well, folks, you heard it here first. God dang, dude. I don't even know what I'm going to do the rest of the day. I just want to go sit and stare at the water <laughs> and contemplate uh, all my life's choices and think what I'm going to do differently moving forward. I'm not kidding. This is really powerful stuff. Dude. Love it, man. I love you. This is great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Of course. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks for coming over, yeah. man. God yeah. dang. Um, is there is there any uh, put you on the spot here? Any words of encouragement for the folks listening for um, sign off today? I mean, I think the only words for encouragement would be, I mean, you guys know who you are. Just stay in it. I mean, there's is, isn't um, there isn't this isn't a confusing life. We just made right. it so. Well said. Yeah. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. All right, everybody. I'm going to go cool off. <laughs> Make sure to hit up Sean Clayton on Instagram, yep. uh, Abundance10,000. Hit him up on LinkedIn. 
I'm Greg Carlson, your host, the Elite League Podcast. Until next time. Absolutely. Love you guys.